presented by the Making Star Wars Podcasting Network. This is the Cantina Cast, your watering hole for thought-provoking Star Wars discussion, character dissections, quote and scene analysis, honest opinions on the Star Wars news that interests you, and whatever else these guys come up with. Here are your hosts, Mike and Joa. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 215, the Rose, Finn, Phasma, and Snoke's Other Apprentice episode. That's a long, long title. I know we promised last... Yeah, exactly. I know last week we promised, Joe and I had promised to do Kylo, but due to his scheduling with work, that didn't work out, so hopefully next week he'll join me and we'll do Kylo. But if not, I'll have Albert here with me like he is tonight. So hello, Albert, and welcome to the show. Say hello to the fine folks. Hello, Mike. Hello, uh, Cantina patrons. Good to see you guys again. All right. Well, excellent. So this so this is, I decided, Albert, when, you know, Joe has said he couldn't make it and we, we had this scheduling conflict and, you know, we were going to take a, a week off. I'm like, no, nah, no, the show must go on. We got to press on. So I decided, all right, I'm going to recruit Albert and we're going to talk about Rose, Finn, Phasma. And this interesting tidbit, bit, which is, which would have tied in with with the Kylo dissection of the Last Jedi, but I and you know we'll probably do a, a Snoke character dissection from the the Last Jedi. But I figured we'd mention this now because it's kind of a a hot issue and stuff. But we'll get to that at the, near the end of the show. We'll save the best for last, so to speak. So, uh, but we did have something interesting news wise. Uh, a few things that we'll touch on right now. And one now I don't know if this is a poster or some kind of I don't know for like a puzzle or something. I don't know what it is, Albert. Maybe you can explain it, but the Han Solo, something leaked with Han Solo. And we finally get our first image of, of, uh, of Alden playing, uh, Han Solo. And, and of course, Donald Glover playing Lando. And I think Emily Clark, I believe is the other, the lady there, the young lady. And of course, Chewbacca, you know, Chew, Chewy, of course, uh, and stuff like that. But when, what did you think? I mean, I don't know where this came from, but you might know a little bit better than I because you posted it in Discord. Yeah. Uh, so it came from Russia with love. Um, it was Those originally. Russians, man. Yeah. They're got to love them. Um, <laughs> so I think it's hard to say, really. So Disney came out and said, hey, we didn't create this. We didn't make it. And I, I'm taking them at their word. They didn't create this. What it does look like, though, is it looks like some. Uh, some kind of production art of some type that maybe we'll see later down the road. Maybe we won't see it at all. But um, I think when you look at this, um, they nailed a lot of the a lot of the finer details or a lot of the details that we know that we've seen from either posts on Instagram or some of the other leaks that have hit some of the sites. So I won't I don't want to discredit this or write it off as not being legit. But at the same time. Um, you know, there it, it's questionable as to whether or not we'll actually see these particular this particular artwork in any of the production final type uh, media and stuff that's released. So uh, it showed up on a calendar, I think. There's some pictures out there, and um, if you look at some of the the leaks and stuff, but there, it showed up on a calendar. There's a site out there you can hit that's in Russian, talks about it. Um, but and that's all we know at this point. But it it looks pretty good. So I'm, I'm willing to, to bet, I'd say about 98%. This is what, this is what the final look like will, will be for, for some of the characters. See what, what makes me think maybe it's not legit is like, maybe they got promos of, of these actors in these poses and they kind of, you know, you can go in there and Photoshop and make anything the way you want. And the Falcon looks like something I think even Jason might've posted on uh, the website there. Uh, you know, in making Star Wars dot com, uh, dot net, and that Falcon might have been the picture that he used because I don't think that's the exact Falcon, or it's like a replica of it. I, I'm not sure that I could be wrong. I know they mentioned the blue mockings on the Falcon at one point uh, in his article. I think a, a months ago, I can't even remember. Like back in, I want to say in over September, the summer, or October. Maybe, yeah, may, maybe, maybe even back then, might have been then and stuff like that. But well, well, what did you think if this is? The look, you know, I, I'm digging Han's jacket here. Actually, it rivals uh, Cassian's jacket that I kind of wanted the uh, the Arctic one, you know, with yeah. the fur on it. Yep. Uh, and Columbia sold out of that in five minutes, so I couldn't get it. But you know, whatever. I don't hold a grudge. Um, but yeah, I, I dig the jacket. Uh, of course, Lando looking suave there, and Chewie's always Chewie, and and that. But what did you think of the Falcon? Because that's the one that jumped out at me 
And then I'll get back to Alden in a second. Uh, it, but, it, but what did you think of the Falcon? Yeah, I would I would agree. That one, that's the one thing that kind of, it sticks out like a sore thumb, uh, only because it's got the elongated cargo, I guess is what we're calling that, or we're speculating that that is that cargo bay that's put on there, because it, you know, it's supposed to be a, uh, a light transport carrier of some type, right? Yeah. Um, so that does look a little bit odd. And I'd, I'd always envisioned just the, kind of the opposite, where the Falcon would, m- you know, pick up the cargo that was more vertical as opposed to horizontal, right? It didn't have that bay, it would pick up the cargo. And I, I guess you could make an argument that, you know, maybe it's got multiple uses and that neither one of those is wrong, right? It could be used in multiple configurations depending on what kind of cargo or what it was trying to haul. Um, the, I guess the lack of clarity, though, on this picture is what really kind of sticks out for me. I, I don't see a lot of detail. And in fact, if you look at the picture that Jason released, um, there's a lot more detail there. And it doesn't really look like this. But again, it, it's really – it's hard to say. Um, but I think overall, everything else looks great. I like Alden. That He doesn't he doesn't look like Han to me. Uh, it doesn't look like Harrison Ford. But well, that's see, okay. It's funny because I was going to say he looked more Han Solo-like. Than here the than fat, he did but yeah than those pitches we saw behind yes. the scenes that leak where he yep. looked like fat drunken <laughs> han solo because uh, right. that's what he looked like to me he, he didn't look and i i know the actor is not like that it just appeared that who knows makeup or whatever the, what they were trying to do there it just appeared that way and it was like oh my god this is yep. a train wreck um and uh, speaking of train wrecks um it appears disney now, this is just rumors. Nobody knows if this is true, if they're thinking that. But apparently they expect it to be a bomb because of all the things that happened. And, of course, with the backlash of The Last Jedi that's going around, maybe they're prepared for the worst. And I, I think us as fans, I know Joe and I have always said this is not the movie we wanted because it's it's risky. You're taking one of the big three and you're putting it in position um, where this might upset people. But you know what? I guess you have our feet are wet because you killed off Luke Skywalker. Spoiler alert if you don't know that. And some people disagree on how his character was handled. So, you know, I guess we're ready prepared for one of the big three to be handled, you know, this way, I guess. Or we won't be too upset, I guess, this time around, maybe. I, I don't know. What What are your thoughts on on the potential of this being a dud? Because uh, this was the always the dangerous one we always thought would be the bad one, so to speak. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I've, I think I've always been of the opinion you don't touch. You don't touch Luke. You don't touch Sean. And you don't touch Leia, at least not, you know prior to a new hope um that said it is what it is it's coming out you know i can either I don't, i'm kind of indifferent at this point I, I even though you know kind of that contradicts what i just said <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm actually maybe I'm, I'm just i'm optimistic right i want to be hopeful that this is actually going to be a good movie and i know i've seen some of that same stuff saying that hey it's going to bomb disney's preparing uh internally for it um yeah, but you would think if they were is a company as big as disney and i'm sure i mean you know, i'm not a uh I don't make movies, obviously, but you would think a company as big as Disney would be prepared for something like that. And and why wouldn't they push it out, right? If they knew this thing was going to bomb and it was going to require more work and time and effort, why wouldn't they just push it out like people talked about? They're sticking to the schedule, and maybe that's uh, hubris or arrogance yeah. on their part. But you know, maybe that's a sign that things really aren't going to be that bad. No, I, I, I don't think it'll be – actually, I'm I'm going into it as like Rogue One. Yeah, where I'm going to be surprised. Like I, w- I was hyped up for Rogue One, but I was like, yeah, well, all right, I'm. It's cool, Star Wars. We'll see where it goes. But I wasn't expecting it to be as good as it was. Um, there's still some issues I have with it, but then again, I have issues with every Star Wars film, even the ones that George did. But I accept them, and I love all of them anyway. You know, even the imperfections make me love it a little bit more because it gives us something to argue about. Um, <laughs> well, at least in the old days, we could argue and, and d- disagree and it would be fine. Now we just make it personal, but that's the whole other story. But uh, speaking of that, we'll get into Mark Hamill, who regrets voicing his concerns about the the Last Jedi publicly. And Joe and I had mentioned this on the Luke Skywalker dissection with the Last Jedi, where, and, and to Joe's credit, he, he cut me off in the middle of me not harping on something that Mark said. Because I was actually agreeing with with what Joe was going to say in his yeah. point there. I was just trying to get to something and Joe had just immediately pounced on it because he does make the point where, you know, Mark will say something, but then he comes in, he finishes off the sentence and no one is is reporting on the end of that sentence or yep. whatever the, the statement's going to be, you know, because I think Mark was saying, yeah, I was nervous at first and now I liked it. And everyone cuts that part of it out, you know, and whereas Mark's saying, well, it's not my Luke Skywalker. All right, I, I get that. But M- Mark, you know... It came out wrong, but Mark should kind of know how crazy all us Star Wars fans are and 
And, you know, we're, it's, it's, it, and we take things so literal and we analyze every little thing. We just go crazy with it. And, you know, Mark kind of feels bad about it because, of course, Ryan's getting backlash and a lot of heat and, and stuff. And, you know, I, I think Mark feels bad because Mark's a nice guy. And I, I don't think he mean, meant any ill will or anything bad about it. It just the way nah. it came out. He was just nervous, as we all are. And we're still nervous trying to process all these things. But, but what do you think about no, what Mark had to say? Yeah, no, I agree 100%. And I, and, and I would agree that, that so much of this has been taken out of context. And you've had people just take this, run with it. They've used it as a sword to, to, you know, slash and dice, whatever, you know, head cannon they want or whatever, you know, whatever they're still clinging to or holding on to. Um, but we got to remember that Mark Hamill had the benefit of about two years to come to grips with the story and his character where we're, you know, we're exactly where he was two years ago. I think when he says that he starts off by expressing where he was, where we are today, some of us anyways, and just the shock of it all. Um, not that it was a bad thing, but it was shocking. It's very different. And again, he's, he's had a long time to, to come to grips. He's, he's gone through it all. He's seen the end product. And now he's, you know, that other part that they're cutting out is, but I'm okay with this. I, I get it. And I actually like it. I appreciate what he's done here. Exactly. I, I just don't know what, and I know that we're in the day and age where journalism isn't really held to a high standard anymore. So, you know, that doesn't get the clicks where you cut the, you know, you, you add in the good parts where he says, well, I, I, I thought it was this, but you know, and I didn't like it at first, but now I like it, you know, par paraphrasing, that's not his exact quotes and stuff like that. But, you know, I, I, and with Ryan as well, I mean, I'm still mixed emotions with the, with the film. I'm, I'm sure you are as well, Albert, we're still processing a lot of things and, and coming to grips with things. I mean, I accept the canon and I understand some of the things and, and stuff. Uh, it's always a danger when you take like the big three and, and do something drastic, especially Luke and, and, and I want to say Leia, where Han, we kind of knew, all right, he's going to die because Han, you know, Harrison wanted to die in Empire and all this. As fans, the, the passionate fans that we are, we kind of knew that. We were prepared for that for 30 exactly. some odd years. And then when we see Luke, who didn't have any dialogue in the, the Force Awakens, and now here we go, and then, you know, all this happens, and we're like, what, what, uh-huh. You know, it takes a little while for us to get our bearings. But anyway, we'll move on for that. Speaking of The Last Jedi, it's hauled in uh, quite a bit, uh, 844 million worldwide, and what are we, up to 424 million uh, yep. in North America now? Um so yeah, and I think that's actually higher, yeah. Mike. Today, I think it, it hit nine hundred million, and it's it should break the one billion mark before the end of the year. Yeah, I mean, although they've said the numbers are down compared to like I guess Rogue One and the Force Awakens and stuff like that, and you know, of course, people are hopping on that as well. But even if it's bad, it's doing pretty darn well, I would think. No, yeah, I mean, it, it is. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't buy it. I mean, I just don't, I don't, I don't buy the fact that it because it's down, it's it's doing badly or it's a poor movie. It just. It's, it's just doesn't it doesn't match up right it doesn't line up it's it's a it's it's a good movie it's doing really well it's going to continue to do well um i was having a conversation today with one of my uh, good buddies and uh, he asked me he's like what do you think is going to dethrone this and honestly looking at the schedule of what's coming out over the next couple months i don't know that there's anything that's really going to dethrone this i think if it if it anything does finally get above it at the box office, it's going to be of it just because it loses its legs or people, you know, it just hit that mark where um, probably Coco, right? Is that the next? Uh... No, that's already out. Oh, Coco's already out. Yeah, oh, Coco's I, I out. didn't know it was out already. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a little off. I'm the um, one. With, well, you got kids. You should know that. I, I know, but uh, you know, my kid watches so many things, as you know, you, it blurs half the time. I don't know she's <laughs> watching. Uh, I, I got to get her away from Fuller House, man, because that's just an awful show as to begin with. But yeah, there's that's things bad she parenting right there. Yeah, it was. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Not the only one who agrees with me. But anyway, uh, but anyway, we'll continue here. So apparently, it's as of today, or through I guess the the twenty second December. I think it passed Beauty and the Beast today, right? I, I would think it's or it's close to it, right? Yeah, I think spot for this? Yeah. it's probably close today, if not have already passed it. I would imagine by the end of the weekend, it'll it'll be there. By the way, we're recording this on the 28th. Yep. Yes, correct. So happy new year, by the way, by the time you hear this. So uh, by then it should be passed and it should be the number one spot. It should hit it before midnight uh, on, on the end of December there. So, you know, that's it's interesting how it's doing better than I thought. But as Joe has said to me, when we were doing our predictions a, a while back, he was saying the second movie never does or performs as well as the first one. And it's turning out he's right here again, which I hate to admit. Um, he's right. Cause I thought <laughs> this would actually kind of 
maybe it'd be the same. I mean, it, technically, it's not off by much. Well, that's what I'm really. saying. Yeah, it's not yeah. performing as good as the first one, but is it doing bad? Heck no. It's it's doing really well. So, yes, it's well, down. I'll, I'll take the, the billion dollars any day of the week. I don't know about you, but yeah, I mean, that's, and that's pretty it, good. Yeah, exactly. And the other thing, I don't, I, they can't see this, but you know, if you look at that list of the top 10 movies for 2017, five of the top 10 um, are all Disney movies, right? So you talk about Disney having a really good year, and, and they've been talking about – Star Wars, they're kind of banking on Disney and Star Wars to kind of at the very end of every year to really kind of help bring up the industry. They make so much movie money off these movies that it really kind of picks everything up. Um, and I don't know if it, I think they were projected for like over 11 billion or something like that. And I think Last Jedi is going to get them there. So, uh, you know, kudos to Disney and Lucasfilm for it. Well, yeah. And even the top movies of all time is mostly Star Wars now. So that's, you know, says a lot. It's still got legs and everything else. So anyway, well, let's get into. I guess the heart of this whole thing uh, is fitting we stop with Rose. Um, so we're going to get into Rose. We're going to get into Finn and like two seconds of Phasma because that's basically all of her screen time in the last two movies and everything else. We could probably stretch it to about 10 seconds. Uh, maybe maybe 15. Maybe 15. <laughs> I don't know. That that fight was pretty epic, but I don't know. See, we even add in time right now. Just say mention her. Yeah, but right. uh, well, let's let's get into Rose. We'll start with the bad with Rose. What would you think of Rose? The bad side of things. I mean, there's good and there's bad with everything, but we'll, we'll start with the bad. We'll get the bad out and then we'll wrap it up with the, the good stuff with Rose. Well, everybody, if you've listened to the podcast last couple of shows, you know how much I hate Maz Kanata, right? So <laughs> the, I don't, uh, I, do, I don't, well, I know why you said it. You said it last time, but she's, continue, she's so. creepy, right? But anyways, <laughs> uh, it was interesting. I was looking at the, uh, the art of book and, and in there, they actually mentioned that Rose and I, I think I'd remember this from, I, I didn't remember until I actually read it again, but uh, Rose was originally the name for Maz Kanata. It was a production code name. In, in the force awakens so right there i already you know that's my See, office. i vaguely remember that too now that now that you mention it i vaguely remember like jason saying something or i saw it in the the force awakens art book i can't remember but anyway continue sir yeah um and i don't know i, I don't want to call her one i'm not going to call her pointless because she's not pointless there's there's quite a few things that you could say she had to be in here for and she did for some of the other characters which we're going to talk about i won't call her pointless at all um she didn't seem she was seemed a little bit one dimensional. There were some quirky things about her. She was spunky. I think we talked about that in the previous episode. Um, but she didn't. She almost felt like she was there just to enable another character. And and knowing uh, knowing what I know about uh, Kelly Marie Tran and and the character itself and what we got from her, it just felt like she didn't really get her her show. You know, in in this movie. And maybe that'll change in nine. Um, but I would, I guess that would be something that yeah, I would see, say as a con. That that's my thing is I don't feel like she Kelly Marie. I love her. She's great. And who could like Mark Hamill said, she's a little, you know, sunshine there. Um, but I don't think she had enough time. Of course, there was a lot going on in, in, in the last Jedi where she couldn't, I mean, even our buddy Finn took a step back in a way. I mean, the Canto bite stuff, a lot of people say, say it, it kind of felt unneeded. And I felt like, yeah, really not needed. Um, only because the space chase was kind of, but that's a whole other argument for another day. But anyway, right. yeah, it's like space whales. But in any case, the, the that whole part of it, I think was just like, like that seemed like her worshiping of, of Finn seemed a little off, like the hero worship right away. I mean, this is supposed to take like, what, five seconds after The Force yeah. Awakens? And, you know, I'm sure his name is running around the building and everything, but he's he's been in a coma and, and, and all that stuff. And you know, we don't even know where Black Squadron is and Snape and, and all that stuff. So that's a whole lot of things got to be filled in. But that hero worship seemed a little odd to me. Um, and, and she seemed a little one dimensional. And the only other thing I would say, the kiss at the end there, it seemed a little out of place to me in a sense, because there was no none of that whole like fin, you know, the, that vibe of I mean, you could make the argument there was more of a vibe of romantic tensions with with. Ray and, 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 Kylo. and Kylo than there was with Finn and Rose here. And then she just kisses him out of the blue and it kind of snaps him into this, this weird thing at the end there. And he, yeah. he wants to save her and everything. So, I mean, not, I'm all for Finn and Rose getting together and having fun there, but I, I just, it just seemed like out of the, like, if anything, I was expecting Kylo and, and Ray to kiss and not these two, Yeah, uh, which actually I'm, I'm better off that these two kissed and not Kylo and, and, uh, <laughs> and Ray. And I yep. know Katie's wanting to yell at the, the computer or whatever she's listening to on the, uh, you know, with the podcast and everything. But in, in any case, uh, what else did you think was 
bad. Yeah, I guess so. Go, going back to the kiss, um, and maybe just let's just talk about the love interest piece of it. Um, I would agree. I didn't. I, I maybe I'm just like old. I wasn't picking up on any vibe there, really. Right? I, I, she was. I wasn't either. She was looking at Finn, right? She admired him as a hero, but I never got the sense in the movie. And I, I'm, I need to go back for my fifth viewing here, but maybe in, in, in there, I'll, I'll kind of focus in on that and see if I'm kind of missing some of these clues, but I didn't get that. And so I was probably just as surprised as you and a lot of other people when it happened. Um, I think when it happened though, I still didn't chalk it up to romance. I think for me, at least in the first couple of viewings that I had, it felt like they just survived something horrible, right? He, he she just risked his life. She just came out of, uh, you know, being unconscious. And it was just one of those things that was in the moment. And I'm curious as to how that's going to play out in nine. Is she, are they going to be, is it going to be their, this uncomfortableness be, be, between them now? Um, of course, some time's going to have to pass. So I don't know that we'll get much of that. Um, you know, or, or, or was it really truly romance and did something, you know, kind of spark for lack of a better term uh, between them there? Cause I mean, he doesn't, he does go and take care of her at the very end. And you can kind of see that he's reciprocating at least some of that care and love that she gave him. Um, but I don't know. I didn't really pick up on the romance. So it, I won't say it, it was awkward, the kiss itself. And I won't say it's, it was out of place, but it was just a little shocking and surprising. And again, maybe again, in my old, old age that I'm just not, picking up on the vibes anymore man maybe maybe that was ryan's big shocking reveal uh, I, no that because that was there wasn't really anything shocking or revealing to me it was more like huh yeah. scratching my head type of stuff but yeah uh in any case actually the the romance set up vibe that i picked up on was ray and poe at the end there i just that look gonna, yeah exactly and the i know you know that i'm just gonna throw it out there katie who's big into <laughs> Raylo. i'm just gonna throw it out there because i'm gonna get her upset now and she's listening to the podcast and everything but in, in any case, uh, but I, I will give her credit. It, it seemed like a more of a love chance interest with Ray and Kylo and Poe and and Ray than than Finn and Rose. Um, so that the, the interesting thing with that is, you know, Finn finally sees Ray, and they hug and they have that moment. And then, of course, you know, Rose is I don't know if she's being worked on or what what's going on there. Um, how's that going to work after? Because you think you get the indication that Finn kind of has a yeah, at least a, an eye out towards Ray. You know what I mean? Like he's got an interest there. I don't know how that's going to be. I know Ray kind of, the way I took it with Ray is she looks at him as a, a close friend and she loves him dearly, uh, that type of thing. So I don't know, maybe maybe we'll get this. Is our love this triangle? Love, yeah, that Joe and I had mentioned in 2013 that we wanted, which is interesting because we don't really side with the whole Raylo thing. But, you know, we, we are in, we're in for some kind of a love dynamic that's kind of chaotic and tragic in a way. Just not with Ray and Kylo, but that's yeah. for but, other reasons. And to, yeah, and to take it back just to what you were. So I agree, and and specifically about you know this uh, with Ray and Poe meeting at the end of the second movie, which seems kind of odd. Um, and then taking yeah. it back to <laughs> what you said earlier about Rose seeing you know being enamored by Finn when not much time has passed. Those two things, along with some other things that we'll probably get in upcoming podcasts really seem to kind of come from a problem that I think I have with the movie. And, and I was, and it's the whole thing about not having any time pass, right? They went from yeah. that first movie to this movie almost immediately. I mean, there's almost an over, well, there is an overlap there. And I don't think that some of these things, I think some of the problems that I have with the movie, and, and again, on the record, I love the movie. I think it's great. But I think some of the issues I have were, is that because there was no time that passed, some of these things, some of these uh, elements, these storylines and plot elements that they put in here don't pay off the way I was expecting them to. They just seem out of place because of that. And that's one – these two specifically are because of that. There wasn't enough time for for me, for Rose to really get enamored with Finn. And the fact that you've got now two main characters just meeting at the very end of the second movie, um, you know, I don't know. This, this doesn't seem like there was enough time for them to really kind of establish that relationship when they probably should have had it because these guys are, you know, your primary characters. Yeah, exactly. Well, and I mean, he was waving at the Falcon at the end. Maybe he was late uh, to the party and just kind of, hey, I missed the hot girl leaving, you know, that type of thing. I don't know. Story of but his anyway, life. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, let's get into the good with Rose. What did you like about Rose? Uh, me personally, I liked her quick wit. I liked her savviness. I liked her her technical, you know, she knew technical stuff, uh, and, and, and all that stuff. I, I and she's brave, obviously. I, I think she's, I don't know where she found that. See, this is the problem with like the whole, her sister dies. We don't even have that moment with her sister where you can get that 
sense of loss. Yeah, we see a crying after, but it, I do get the sense and the feeling on my second time around where, all right, she's doing this because her sister's kind of being that catalyst. Yeah, you get that, especially when she rips off the necklace and gives it to DJ to say, you know, you know that type of thing. Uh, I thought that was very courageous for her. She's letting go of something sentimental, which is a theme throughout the whole movie, really. Yep, that's uh, right. And stuff like that. So I, I loved that about her, and I loved her character. It just seemed like it was, you know. But anyway, I'll, I'll let you go. What, what did you like about uh, Rose? Yeah, I think um, – so I think we talked about her – just her spirit um, was awesome. I think it's fresh. I think we needed that in a character in Star Wars, um, honestly. Um, I would also say that with Rose – we have another like morally grounded character, kind of like Ray, right? She's she's not she's not she's not bad. She can't be tempted by bad. She, everything she does comes from the heart. She's all about you know family. You know we've talked about that on previous episodes. So some of those tones still rang true. Those beats that we've seen in other previous Star Wars movies hold true with this character. Um, I think she's. I think they they came they played her up as you know being super intelligent. Um, you know she's a she is a no one right. She is nobody. She is just a ground level worker who finally had her moment, and when that came, she seized it and she's become this hero now. So um, I think all of that's good. And I, again, for 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 Rose and the character itself, I think she's I think she's great. I think she's got a lot of spirit, and I'm really excited. I don't know. I mean, I put the question in here, and we'll probably talk about it later. We can talk about it now, but. Where does her character go from here? That's the thing that I'm not really sure of. Like, where what's left for her to do now? Is there anything that, that we see yeah. in either TFA or this movie, or is it going to be something completely different that we're not aware of just yet? Well, that's that's the thing because the the big debate now, and I've mentioned it a few times, and it's gotten some traction after the fact, is because we didn't get a time jump, which we we I think we agree is where the our issues start from, and it makes few things muddy. I guess you could say. And there's other stuff, but we'll get into that another whole other day. Um, but I, I think that that's that's where it's coming from. I I don't know. I mean, I I don't know. I mean, she's she's a good character. I'd like to see more of her. I I think we will. And I think, like I was saying, is we will get that time jump where there's a few years have gone by and she's more of a a leader because she's got that leadership quality in her. I mean, she snapped Finn out of his you know, cowardly, cowardly ways, which Ray didn't even get to do in a sense. And he came back and she saved him from the, I, I think personally, well, we'll get into this with Finn in a minute, but anyway, you know, she got him out of that rut, so to speak, and, and did something great. She's got those leadership abilities. And like you, she kind of mirrors Ray in the sense where she's morally good and not going to be swayed. And she's going to do the right thing very much like Luke and the original yeah. trilogy and stuff like that. So, I, I mean, she's got a lot of, noble traits and everything but like you it's almost like finn in a sense you've got this character now and they're a fan favorite so you got to do something i mean guess i guess this is the problem with canto bright bright bite is everyone kind of thinks like it was just made just so you could have finn in it and rose and and all that other stuff which i don't really agree with i think ryan was trying to do something and it didn't really come off that way exactly um so that's a bit there but overall i, I like even like when she's you know talking about Canto Bright and stuff and, and making this moral, uh, I guess, opinion at, at that moment there, it shows she's a little more, got a little more depth. I don't want to get into the whole politics of that, but she's got more depth to her character than just like, say, the run-of-the-mill person that just helps out or something like that. Like, Broom Boy, apparently, is, you know, just, uh, you know, help the guy out, and then they, they go on, and I get a cameo at the end there type of stuff. I, I guess that would, you know, there's more to her than that. So, I don't know, any more to, to say on Rose, and we'll move on to our my buddy uh, Finn. Yeah, um, yeah, just a couple more things. So I, I get so look into the future. Um, I'd like to see her in this role where she's kind of checking everybody, uh, being that moral compass, saying no, stupid, don't do that. Here's why. Right, being the smartest one in the room would be kind of cool. I mean, she did some really cool stuff that we don't know about. I, I put in the notes there about the baffle system, which uh, she came up with. Right, she came up with this whole system that allowed those shuttles to leave undetected by radar. You don't ever hear about it. They don't talk about it. And I've seen people complaining about. Well, how the heck did they not see those ships going, right? Well, she did that. She purposely did all that to those shuttles. Um, so she's obviously got some crazy intelligence here, and I'd like to see more of that in um, in the next movie. Um, yeah, I don't know. And this is going to be – this is a crazy idea. Uh, but, you know, Ray's got to build up some kind of force now, right, of Jedi. 
maybe it's Rose. I don't know. Maybe there, maybe there's something there. Maybe she taps into it or they give her that extra dimension there. Um, but either way, I mean, I, this could go a lot of different ways with her. I mean, she's got kind of a blank canvas, so, so to speak, uh, going into nine. So I'm pretty excited to see what they do. Yeah. I, 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 like I said, I like their character. I like what Kelly Marie Tran did. Hopefully we'll see more of that going forward. I, I don't know. I mean, with I, again, nine has got its work cut out for him and we'll see where things go. I guess you could say, all right. Yep. So, Let's get into Finn here. Uh, what has changed since the last time we've seen him? Uh, when we first meet him, obviously, he's, he's first things out of his mouth is Ray. He's very concerned about Ray walking around, you know, leaking everything with the back, the fluid and everything. And, and Poe kind of, you know, getting him up to speed and everything. Um, It seems he was still in his old ways of just like I said, this is where Rose's character shines because she's able to snap him out of this. Uh, more so than Ray at the time, you know what I mean? Like in the yeah. Force Awakens, Ray doesn't even get to do that. So he's still he running, this, right? Exactly. He's still running at the very beginning. He's he's not just necessarily running, but he's going. He doesn't care about what the heck's going on. He just woke up from a coma. And what's the first thing he does? He wants to go save his one, like his really the, maybe second, but only friend that he has. So he's getting. He doesn't care. He's going to pack that bag. He's going to jump in that shuttle. He's getting out of Dodge, and he's going to go try to so, say that friend. So he he picks up exactly where he left off in the Force Awakens. Well, it's true, and I mean, it, and again, I want to mention this: is Ray is kind of his call to action. I know, I know, Rose kind of snaps him out of it when when she juices him and everything. But he, you know, when she mentions what could happen or whatever and all that other stuff, and and they have their conversation, he realizes Ray is in danger, and Ray is his concern. And it, yeah, it may be selfish at this point, but he's he's also this is like an awakening for him where he's kind of going away from those whole, you know, selfish get out of Dodge, almost DJ like in a sense, which is an interesting dynamic with when he's with DJ. Uh, and there's something interesting with DJ. We'll we'll have to get into DJ at some point and, and talk about him and his philosophical view of things, so to speak. Yeah. I, I like that aspect of the film. I wish we had a little bit more of that with him. And he was undercut. Like they, they should have used him more. The other he's got the comic make... coming out, by the way. Sorry, Mike, I didn't I mean to interrupt, but he's oh, got that oh. comic book coming out. But so maybe we'll oh, get well, something in that. Well, you know me in the comics, as everybody knows. <laughs> I mean, I'll probably read it just to see because I like DJ. It was compelling. The other argument you could make is that, like, why have DJ be the hacker, not not Rose? Yeah, I guess. But or know, just hey, let yeah. the master codebreaker go with him, which I think was originally. I think it was originally the case in the art book. I think I remember reading that originally he was going to go with yeah. uh, Finn and Rose. Um, but Correct. anyways. Yes. But anyway, so what did you think since we last ran into him in the Force Awakens and stuff? Well, what do you think in the beginning? How do, how do you think it all developed with him changing, so to speak? Yeah, I think it was good. I, I, we we kind of heard – we kind of got wind of all of this as maybe – I wouldn't say go so far as to say it's a spoiler, but – Early on, when we saw like the um, the Entertainment Weekly, um, the Anthony Resnickan releases, they mentioned that that he was very much in the same mentality that he he where he was in the Force Awakens, um, and it was Rose. Rose is his you know his conscious. It was his moral compass to say, look, this is not the right thing, and um, I think that was uh, his view. Rose's view of him, right, seeing the hero in him. That he had never seen in himself before. That was the, that was kind of a big turning point for him. And it's a very short scene, right? We don't get a whole lot of it there, but I think it was enough. I think he did enough to at least establish that, hey, there's somebody that's looking at me, right? He, you can even see it in uh, his posture when he kind of leans up and he kind of stands acts up a cool. little bit straight. Yeah, he acts yeah, cool. Yeah. May the force be with you, kind of thing, right? He's he's playing the character because he sees that. Whoa, somebody sees that in me, and that's it's kind of shocking and new to him. Um, so I think that was. Um, Exactly where I think he would have been at the very, at the beginning of the movie, um, and exactly how he would probably go with with seeing somebody like Rose, who's just you know what he was basically, um, just an average Joe worker, uh, seeing him as a hero at that point. Yeah, so there's a bit of a kinship there, um, and you know it's just a uh, it, it's interesting that he would come across someone that would worship him in that way because this is where he gets relatable with me, and I know this I, this might sound self righteous maybe i don't I don't know what the right term is but like uh, it's it's like those times like like fedex tom who's a friend of mine and he, he obviously works for fedex and stuff but he just showed up at my house one day and rang the doorbell and my wife thought it was a package and because i usually get packages delivered and he said oh is mike here and she's like oh yeah why has he got a package and he said was well, this mike from the cantina cast and my wife was you know like 
kind of stunned by that, that, you know, people listen to the show and all that. And, and for someone like, like me and like Joa, and when you have people come up to you and say, I like your show and that like when they really like in person, when they come up to you, you kind of get humbled and baffled and it's a strange feeling. So that for me, that moment in the, in the, in that scene made me think of that whole thing. And, and, you know, when I meet people who like, they make it like a big thing and I, it's not a big deal. I just podcast about Star Wars. I'm nothing special. It's not that big of a thing, but you know, for someone who looks up to, to you and, and what you do in, in, in that kind of light, it's, it's a very humbling thing. I wouldn't play it off as cool as, as uh, John Boyega did there in, in the movie. I'm not that suave or that cool. <laughs> uh, but it, it just made me relate to the character and that sense of it all. And, uh, and stuff. But what else? What else did you like with Finn? Where else did you think he went? Where he could have went? Uh, where he fell short? Um, so I thought he he did a. I think I really liked his his character arc in this. Um, yeah, I, don't get me wrong. I mean, Canto Bite had its issues, and we're, I don't know if we want to get into that here. We're not gonna we're not gonna tear Canto Bite apart. They already did that in the movie. But uh, there there are obviously some things in there that that didn't work. But I think overall, when you look at his his character, I think he goes across uh, the hero's journey. Right? He hits a lot of these. Um, a lot of the stages in there, uh, you know, the very first one being, you know, his, his the way Rose sees him, right? That's his his call to adventure, or maybe the fact that he, he's then he's, he rejects it, yeah, yeah, and then he rejects it, right? Um, you know, and there's, you know, I thought there was another one that really kind of stood out was that the the next stage of the um, the first part, uh, the supernatural aid where uh, they get a talisman, right? It says there's a talisman or artifact that aids him, and I immediately thought of Rose's medallion. Um, oh, yeah. And, yeah. and I'm not going to hit every one of these because, I mean, you can you can probably go look it up and, and kind of apply it to yourself. But I think he hit all of those things. And I thought at the very end of the movie, you know, we see we see him at the very beginning of the movie still running from things, not wanting to to be a part of all that. And by the end of the movie, he's going to complete opposite. Right. He's sacrificing his life uh, for the greater good for everyone else. And it's not so much about Ray anymore. It's about everybody that's there. He he's so determined to do it um, that I think that is a that's a great great development for him to go complete opposite from where we saw him in in, in the Force Awakens, um, which is interesting because it was like a mini hero's journey because you yeah. didn't see the whole it was fit in pretty well to be honest. I mean, you get stuff from you could even go to the Force Awakens. He's had maybe two hero's journeys, I guess you could say in, in a sense. And uh, the, I was gonna, with Canto Bite. The one thing I'll say about that with Finn. And he's sitting there, he's going through the, the casino. It's almost like he's like realizing how big the world and the universe is now. Like he's getting a bigger appreciation of, of things and like he sees the beauty of it all. And then he learns the, the darker side of it, so to speak, of Canto Bite. And he's kind of, he gets the bigger picture, which I think helps him in that moment of sacrifice because he realizes the bigger picture. And that's why, you know, all that plays, that Canto Bite stuff kind of plays into where we see him in the end where he's going to take on the the pulse cannon there or whatever you want to call it and stuff like that. So that that kind of ties in very nicely and I, I liked that aspect of it where he's ready to sacrifice himself and I kind of personally it's almost Han Solo like like uh, you know Harrison Ford back in you know Empire Strikes Back I, sh- I should have died um I can't really didn't have anything else to do but uh you know that type of thing and well that was a horrible Harrison um <laughs> <laughs> Mark could do it better. Mark Hamill. Mark um, does so, it great. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I, I thought it would have been great if he died. I mean, everyone else was dying in the film. Why not one more? Right. I mean, at this yeah. point. Um, but then again, it would have maybe cheapened what happened with Phasma, so to speak. And, you know, maybe there's something that could happen. And we're going to get into that in a second. But what did you think? Do you think he should have died or was it enough that he was ready to sacrifice himself for that moment, which showed the growth and then Rose saving him? You know, because again, she's like she's like Ray. She can't let that happen. She kind of just goes with it, and it's just a natural thing to to save your friend like that. I don't know. What, yeah. what do you think? I think um, if you look, if we if we just take it, take that little hero's journey in the Last Jedi, and throw out the fact that no time passed again, but <laughs> if we just take that little arc, I think it would have been okay for him to die. I wouldn't have wanted to die because I love the character. Um, but I think he would have done, and I think if you just, again, look at that, I think he's probably done enough. He's gone through it. He's developed, he's grown, um, that I would have been okay with him sacrificing himself. Would it have made a difference? No, it probably would have been in vain. It probably would have, again, like you said, taken away from the phasma thing and all of that. But, um, you know, I don't, not, again, I'm not advocating that he should have died. I'm just saying that had he died, I thought it would have been a noble. Well, it would have completed kind of, that hero's journey, journey yep. basically. It would have been, okay, it's done. You know, that, I mean, it's completed. 
and we can kind of move on. But I think they obviously have other plans for him going, the, which I'm looking forward to, to be honest. I'm, I'm curious to see how things will go in nine with this whole, because there's like nobody left really. And there's got to be more left because Snape and Black Squadron are going to be out. I assume they evacuated before all the bad things went down and, and, and stuff like that. And then maybe there was something going on where they couldn't answer the call. I don't know. Maybe we'll find out a little bit more in the Battlefront 2 campaign in a couple of months when they do new DLC or something. And uh, our favorite alien will be in it and stuff. So we'll find out, uh, hopefully, at some point what all that's about. Yeah. But, uh, I, well, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say one last thing about Finn. I, the one thing I really do like about his character is he's got to do so many different things. If you think about it, his he was a maintenance worker. He goes on his first mission. He has that battle. He leaves the First Order, right? He flies yep. in, in a TIE fighter, gets, uh, makes it over there with them. Um, he gets to hold a lightsaber. He goes to, <laughs> to uh, Maz's the castle. Then he fights with the lightsaber. He, you know, he, he's just been on this incredible journey. That's just in the Force of Weekends, right? And then you get into <laughs> um, you know, The Last Jedi. Here he is. He's going to Canto Bight. You know, he's riding father years. He's doing these these good moral things with releasing the animals and, you know, um, instilling inspiration in these kids. And then you know, he has this massive fight again with Phasma, which we'll get into in a second. Um, and then he's, you know, out there at the very end, sacrificing his life for the universe or the galaxy, so to speak. So um, he's just had a great, great journey from, from in just in the first two movies, probably done more arguably than any of the other characters, at least that we know that we see in the movies themselves. Again, it goes back to that. He could have died and it would have been fine. It wouldn't have been, uh, you know, it would have been all right. I mean, not fine because we all love the character. It's just fine. Like story wise and his hero's journey wise. But speaking of uh, an integral part that was hyped up is Phasma and him duking it out. Um, basically Ugh, that yeah. whole fight. I mean, it was interesting, but I thought it was too short to be honest. And I'm I'm wondering if it's because Gwendolyn Christie was in that armor and moving around in that is got to be next to impossible. I thought she did a good job to even move the way she was, and then Finn doing his thing. I just yeah, they was, asked her. Yeah. They asked her what what uh, I forget what interview it was. Which armor was more difficult to move around in the armor from uh, Star Wars as Phasma or the armor that she uses in Game of Thrones? And she mentioned that the armor in Game of Thrones was harder to move around in, which would make sense since you know it was mm -hmm. made. It would arguably be hundreds of years. If it we're going by medieval times or that was made a long time ago, you know, comfort yeah, probably sure. wasn't at the forefront of it. But, um, but yeah, that, that whole fight, um, boy, that was really, I have yet to find anybody that said, yep, that delivered exactly what I was hoping for in the last Jedi. It, it just, it really didn't. And, you know, timing wise, maybe they had to cut some stuff out. Um, and maybe I got more out of it, and you probably did as well, Mike, because you read read the novel. Uh, we yeah. probably got more out of that fight than just the average person. But I really feel bad for anybody that didn't read the novel, that didn't read the comic book, that didn't really know a lot about Phasma and just saw, okay, I've seen these trailers. I've seen these previews. I've been typing it up. You got Finn screaming, come on. And then here we go. What was it, 30 seconds? Yeah. Maybe. I mean, it, was, it was very short, very sweet. I would have liked a more, I don't know, maybe, you know, because even in the old – days with the other lightsaber they weren't that long they just seemed longer and epic maybe um but this just seemed maybe because it's it's phasma and everything is like 30 seconds with her and that so i i think the other thing is you didn't get that sense of like that rivalry or that hatred towards each other i mean you got it with finn because you could read him and he was like all right let's come on let's do this you know that type of thing and you got a bit of the sarcasm and the pleasure that she was going to get from uh, executing him but there wasn't that oomph, like in like that bigger sense of hate, I guess you could say. I, I don't know. I, 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 it felt a little uncomfortable. I mean, I liked the fight and I thought it was interesting when he came back and he whacked her on the head and that. And then she had, you know, the the eyepiece hanging out. And when you go to the novel there, nobody sees who she is, because if you do, she kills you. Yeah. And Finn kind of saw her and, you know, the eyes are the window of the soul or whatever, that whole thing. So that was interesting that they went with that. Um, now the whole thing, it will get into Phasma right now. We'll just bleed right into Phasma is her arc is really none at all, uh, other than being a scapegoat for Finn, I guess, or a punching bag for Finn. And maybe, I mean, she is technically the Boba Fett of this trilogy, right? I mean, yeah. that's what she is. She's the cool bad guy that lasts two seconds. And another, I guess you could say she died in a lame way. I, I don't know. 
she fell through a, a pit again, like most of the bad guys do. Um, she fell in the pit, and then you know it's we're led to believe she's dead. However, see, my argument is: did she fall into space? Because she probably would die if that happened. I mean, I'm sure we'll get a comic in a month or two <laughs> where she survived yet again right. because she's like the Darth Maul of this this whole thing, uh, where Darth Maul, you know, lasted, you know, throughout the Clone Wars and Rebels and everything like that. And maybe in 30 years we'll have a cartoon and Dave Filoni will kill off, you know, Phasma finally. I don't, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I think I think you, her yeah. I think her fate kind of cuts on the line of just how cool do you think she is? Because if you really <laughs> love her and think she's awesome looking, like Boba Fett, you're like, man, she survived. There's no way about it. She lived. But if you're like, I really don't care, and she was kind of cool, that kind of thing, you're probably like, nope, she's dead. Good riddance. If she never comes back, that's fine too. Um, I see. Think, I, yeah, go ahead. Go no, ahead. I was just going to say one of the th- or a couple other things about uh, Phasma. Um, so we know from the novel that when she has a spear in her hand, she cannot be bested, right? They made that very clear. Um, she just slaughters everyone with it. And even even though, yes, I knew I knew most, if not all, of the movie going in be, to the first showing, the fact that we knew that they were going to confront each other from the trailers, and then we saw Finn in one of the little ski speeders at the very end of the movie at Canto Bite. I was I already knew going into it, even with the spoilers before that, that okay, somehow he doesn't lose this battle. Something else has got to happen here. It seems super short. Um, the way she did win, I guess technically speaking, right? She knocked Faz, she knocked uh, Finn off, and there just happened to be that floating platform. And of course, he got you know he what she wasn't expecting it, and I get Rose all that. Kind of distracted her enough to save Finn to so save I Finn, guess. right? But um, yeah, I don't know. I really wanted more from it, and and I'm not. This is not. This is not one of those things that I'm really hung up about either, right? I'm not you know <laughs> writing f- f- Tumblr posts about how much I hate this now because of the fact that Phasma uh, was so short and she was cut out. But um, I like Gwendolyn Christie. I like the character. I've always liked the look, um, which is really cool. So going back to what I said, I really like her a lot. I like the way she looks. And if I'm really hoping that she does come back. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, we've got Maul already, so why not just make Phasma too? Let's just keep it going. Just bring everybody back at some point. We've got a Boba Fett movie rumored, so who knows when that's going to take place. But um, I think I'd be okay if she came back. And for Phasma, um, one other thing about Phasma, I think she is everything that Finn hates about the First Order. Right? He doesn't see Hux. He doesn't see Kylo Ren. He doesn't see Snoke. To him, the First Order and everything that he hated about his life prior to that is Phasma. She is the embodiment of that hate. And I think that's why when you go back and you look at Finn's journey, when he gets to that point where he's got a, you know, the, that whole atonement of the father, in this case, I guess it'd be the mother, um, you know, Phasma is, is that power that's still cold or still that entity that confronts him or still holds power on him. Um, again, going by the, going by that, the uh, hero's journey thing. Um, so I think this was – it had to happen. A lot of people ask why, you know, why did Finn have to confront her? Why was the whole Canto Bite thing there? Um, maybe it was a driver. Maybe it was something to, to kind of help um, propel Finn to meet up with her again because he needed to have that confrontation. Um, it just kind of fell short, and who's to say why? Maybe it's timing. Maybe we'll get something later on. But, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a, little, a bit of a letdown for sure. Yeah, I see, because initially I thought she was dead, and then – the second time, I'm like, mm, she could have survived that um, because the question is, and I need to see it again. Did she fall in space? And if that's the question, maybe she has the force and she can fly Mary Poppins style like Leia. Oh, boy. Or, or she just, you know, fell on a platform around fire and she could survive. Did it? That, yeah, because that armor is tough as nails, as we saw. And they made a point that things were ricocheting off of her. So one could say maybe she did survive i mean i hope she does because i would like to see finn's face if she showed up again and he'd be like holy god what do i gotta do to to kill her (laughs) you know and then we have a whole obi-wan and maul thing for the next 30 years it'll be interesting to say the least but i i think we've gone on long enough with with phasma uh i think we went on longer than her whole entire screen time yep um so we're gonna move on to something interesting we'll finish up with this where it's been said that Snoke has had another apprentice or apprentices, I should say. Uh, and a few things when I, I read this that jumped out at me is one in the Plagueis novel. And this is no surprise to me. So I just want this is why I'm going through these points here. In the Plagueis no- novel, Plagueis kind of dissolves the rule of two. Not that this is canon or anything, 
Um, but Sidious kind of sticks with it after, you know, he kills his master and everything, which makes sense for Sidious because he's very power hungry. I, I get the point at this point, like Plagueis is more feel out the force and all these other things. And, and Sidious is more into the power stuff and which is why he succeeded his master there and stuff like that. So, you know, and then you had, but then again, it really wasn't that because, you know, you had, he had Maul and then he had Dooku who Dooku had, uh, count. He had adventurous, right? Yeah. So, and then he had a savage. Savage so, yeah. so, so it's like, it was loosey goosey, the rule mm-hmm. too, I guess you could say. Well, and it also, uh, yeah. you know, I was going to say, like, I, even with Snoke, he's, we know he's not Sith. So, you know, yeah. this really may not even apply to him. He doesn't care. He probably could have as many, he could have many apprentices. Well, I was um, just going to get into, into point yeah. two is where when Sidious and Vader, Vader die, the Sith are dead. That's it. The rule of two goes with them. The whole thing goes with them. Now, that's not to say that someone couldn't be reading the Sith lore and the knowledge and everything, because I'm sure there's those sacred Sith texts out there, too. Um, but the, the 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 thing that was always interesting with Mortaris, and I always bring it up and drive Joe nuts for the last three years, is that, you know, the father, one of my favorite characters of all time in Star Wars, and yes, he was a cartoon character, there are some that would like to exploit our power. The Sith are but one. Which makes me always think of Snoke in a way. When I, you know, when you go back and you find out about Snoke and all this stuff and Mm -hmm. all the hype leading up to it, you're like, well, maybe the father was, because Snoke is supposedly old. And you're thinking, maybe he's talking Snoke here now, like when you're thinking these things. Uh, So, you know, and the other thing I want to mention is Kylo, you know, when he slaughters the the temple and everything, he took a handful of students. Now, are these the Knights of Ren? We assume that. I guess that's where they would go with it because we see him with a bunch of people around him in that village or whatever. Did they become the Praetorian gods or are these just something Snoke did on his own? Because it seems like Snoke's kind of getting a whole bunch of other maybe force users that are dark side and kind of doing his thing with them. And the other thing we know is that Snoke likes to pit people against each other, which is what the Emperor used to do. You know, we had not that we saw a lot of it here with uh, Hux and, and, and Kylo Ren, but he did do that. He does, you know, kind of pit them like big brother, little brother kind of against each other, like that father that would do that cruelly for some reason and, and do that. So it's no surprise that he would say, all right, Kylo, I got you, but you know what? This uh, Joe over here, he's pretty good, uh, pretty good force user too. I mean, I know you're a Skywalker and all, but he's, he's pretty powerful. This Joe, nobody here. So, you know, don't think you're, <laughs> I thought you're you said so this cool. Joe over here. No, 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 Joe. No, no, Joe is not that special. So anyway, uh, <laughs> You know, so that's that's the way I'm going with this. And, uh, you know, we, we mentioned, I think when we were doing the listener feedback, when you were on here, Albert, that, you know, someone mentioned in the questions, will Kylo have an apprentice? Well, this is where he's probably going to come from now. Wouldn't that make sense? So yeah. I'll throw it to you. What did you think of all this stuff? I know I made yeah. my points, but what are your points, sir? Um, no, so, uh, so going back to um, the Praetorian Guards and whether they're the Knights of Ren, I think it's still open. It's certainly a possibility. I think if it is, if they are, it seemed like a really missed opportunity to at least just say it somehow in about way, in a roundabout way that, hey, Kylo, you know, or at least make that. It would have been much more powerful for me, I think, knowing that those dudes that he was slaughtering with Ray were his, you know, his companions at one point. Um, so, so that would lead me to believe that maybe they aren't. Um, I'd like to see JJ bring them back, um, which I think would be great. And I think he's going to, cause it's just, I mean, there's too much there that they laid out that, um, that, you know, Ryan just kind of completely ignored and didn't touch. So it's pretty much fair game for JJ, JJ to bring that back in. Um, I would agree. Snoke is manipulative. Um, we looked at, um, you know, when you look at the visual dictionary, uh, they spent a lot of time talking about his powers um, and, and, and the power that he has to kind of influence people. And you would think somebody with the dark power and the ability to influence and persuade uh, would be all over manipulating people to the nth degree at any given time at any, you know, every turn to get what he wants from it. So I think that's pretty much going to be a given uh, for Snoke going into it. Um, and then as far as Ray, or I'm sorry, as far as uh, Kylo Ren and The Apprentice, um, I think it could play two ways. You could either have a scenario where you've got – maybe you have Kylo reaching out to that person. Maybe he's aware of it. We don't know. But if he is, maybe he takes that person um, and that becomes his apprentice and – Together, they, you know, that beca- his that's his replacement for Ray. And, um, you know, if there's a time jump, maybe we'll get to hear about or see. You know, I don't want to do flashbacks again, but maybe we'll get to hear about or read about, you know, what his apprentice and him have been doing this time, or at least see some of the, um, uh, the see the outcome of some of that. 
Uh, but it could go another way too. You know, maybe that apprentice knows that Snoke's out of the picture and they feel like they're the rightful heir to that throne. And so now you've got this dynamic where you've got this apprentice that used to fall under Snoke, who learned under Snoke, and you've got Kylo Ren who did the same thing and they're kind of vying. So you've got not only Kylo fighting the front of the in the, the new rebellion, but you've got also this first order or this faction of the first order that's being led oh, by his Hux, apprentice. Hux would probably join that apprentice there and uh in trying to get rid of uh, Kylo, I would think, because it seems like he would plot against oh, Kylo, yeah. if you ask me. The other the other timing thing, just and we'll get back into the apprentice thing. Well, it kind of ties in with that, is with the time lack of a time jump is where he says, Bring Kylo Ren to me and I'll complete his training. What training? Yeah, it never it was happened. Like five, there was no training, what other than going before him and and talking about things. Is was that the, the training? I, I don't know. We'll have to hopefully, you know, I'm sure we'll get a comic book that explains it half way and you know we'll have to accept it or whatever but you know uh i think obviously he's going to seek a new apprentice because i and maybe we touched on this on the the listener feedback i can't remember is where ray rejects him so he's going to want somebody what i would like to see him do is bring the knights of ren in but have it like the the knights of the round table but they're all dark side users and stuff like that and he's the leader you know like king arthur and stuff like that but he's obviously bad from a certain point of view uh, Katie, uh, you know, that type of stuff. And, and I think that would be pretty cool if they go that way. Cause the Praetorian guy, you would imagine, all right, Kylo's going to want his own, you know, groupies to kind of protect him and be around and do his kind of bidding and stuff. And these would be the guys. I, I don't know. What, what yeah. else you got no, to I, say? I can see yeah. that too. I can see him calling him back up, you know, Hey man, we're getting the band back together. Kind <laughs> exactly. of thing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The blues brothers song is playing and you know, mom's in the back seat. you know, that whole thing, but <laughs> right. uh, uh, literally cause Carrie was in the movie, but uh, you know, I'm just saying, well, what what else do you think of, of this whole training of the apprentice stuff and and whatnot? Um, I'm looking forward to it, and I would like to. I, I hope they they kind of dive into it more, right? I I want to see all that. That's that's interesting stuff to me because we, we, I let me think about this. Have we ever gotten any kind of dark side training outside? And and not I'm not talking about like Clone Wars and and stuff, but in the movies themselves, we've never really kind of seen that aspect. So you're talking about the general audience getting to see something we've never seen, right? Um, that dynamic of of the apprentice um, and master again, which would be kind of cool. Yeah, we don't really uh, we get the promise of that, like you know this, you know, one oh, yeah. learn the power of living, you know, that whole thing in the Revenge of the Sith, but we don't yep. get anything concrete or anything like that so and it's interesting because with snoke and and he's and we'll have a snoke dissection at some point soon um because i gotta get my thoughts on snoke because that even that visual dictionary hints at things that we didn't see think of of another dark side user and you know there was nothing that was really debunked i'll just leave it at that like a lot of things weren't really debunked they were kind of just maybe ignored or kind of you like scratching your head but there's still maybe life in some things so we'll we'll find out there but uh anything else left to say on snoke and his apprentice um or his multiple apprentices i mean i because you gotta imagine all right the praetorian gods they're his you know secret service people the knights of ren are the guys like uh you know the navy seals they send out and, and go do their thing and, and you don't hear about it type of stuff and kylo is obviously the master of them so it makes sense that kylo has his knights of round table stuff with the with them so I imagine that they're still out there. I mean, it's not, I guess because it, it goes back to what Jason reported on. There was seven or eight of them in that. And then you see how many guards we get eight, I guess. And then the armor, the plating is what eight things on the side or whatever. It just yeah, like all- the numbers all seem to jive where you would say, all right, that's, they became the Praetorian guards and they guard Snoke and, and everything else like that. Uh, the end, cause I actually, to be honest, I really need to know, after Kylo loses his mind and he slaughters the Jedi and he takes several with him, I need to know that story really bad to get a better <laughs> picture of this whole thing. You right. know what I mean? Where, what happened to them? Yeah, exactly. Because was you know as as Luke was saying, well, Snoke had already turned his heart, and that's why Luke was concerned. It wasn't about the mind; it was the heart. Where he when he was probing and being creepy, Luke in the in the, the temple and that you got to imagine that. All right, well, maybe Snoke had a few people that would like that. Because why would they blindly just follow, follow Kylo after that, where they were just getting into this like peaceful whatever that whole school of thought was with, with with Luke? Because that's the interesting part. Like, why would they just split off? Or maybe maybe it's a uh, self preservation, and they're like, all right, this guy's wacky and he could kill me. I'll, I'll go with him. Yeah. <laughs> you know that type of yeah, thing. Yeah, like yeah. No, I was gonna say, Mike, you're hitting on you're hitting on another. And again, I don't. This is. Uh, 
you're hitting on something else about the last Jedi that didn't, I guess didn't sit well with me. And it's that they drop these bombs on us, these like crazy important things, at least in my head. Okay. This is my opinion, but these really important things that you just want to know about, but they don't let you see it. You know, you don't get to know anything more than what they say. Um, and I think I really want to, to your point earlier, I want to know that stuff. That seems like really important. We got a lot of that in the force awakens and it didn't manifest in the last Jedi. So hopefully it doesn't happen when we get into nine. I hope, you know, JJ takes that and sees all, see, you know, takes all those things, puts them in nine or at least addresses them in, in some way. Um, so JJ Abrams, I know you listen to this podcast. Uh, as, as does George. Yeah. As does George Lucas. Save us JJ Abrams. You're our only hope. Yes, exactly. Well, I, I mean, I don't, you know, JJ has said that he wants, he's going to tie all the trilogies together. I don't know how the hell you'll do that. That's a big how, under, yeah. Wow. I don't know how you're going to piece together what Ryan did into episode nine. Because the, the thing with episode eight is the way it ended, which was an unusual, I don't have a problem with it. It's just unusual for a Star Wars film. And then you're like, okay, well, what next? Because it's going to, how do you pick up from there? Obviously the resistance rebuilding. And, and you would think nine is the close of this sequel, but I think nine is almost like the, the setup for the next, you know, maybe 10, 11 and 12 or something like that. So there's a, there's a lot to be worked out. Let's just say that. Um, hopefully I'll, I'll say this. If we're not going to get all these answers on the screen, we better start loosening up this whole stuff with the novels and the comics and, and the, and you know, with the, the TV series, we better start getting some more answers and, and backfill. Now, if you're not going to do it on the movies, they better do something like that make the books count, as I've been saying for a while. For a while, it's just been kind of, you know, even keel, drop a few hints, and maybe we'll pay off in a movie 10 years from now. And no, we don't have patience for that. Come on, you see how crazy we are on, on Twitter when things go crazy. <laughs> so anyway, I guess that's going to wrap it up for the show. Uh, unless you have anything else to add, Albert, or if you have anything you wanted to say, sir. Uh, nope. Uh, I'm good. Save us, Delray. Delray yes. books are our only hope. Exactly. All right. So with that, just uh, if you want to know where to find us, like us and all that other stuff, check check the show description. It's in the show description. Click on the links and you'll find us wherever you want to go. And with that, we are going to end the show and we will see you guys next week. You're still listening? Wow. That's amazing. Well, I'm here to give you the disclaimer. Normally we do a big, long, drawn-out disclaimer thing saying what's what and who's what and all that other stuff, but I think you guys kind of know that Lucasfilm and Disney have uh, no affiliation with us at all, uh, and we have none with them. Uh, we talk about Star Wars, which is their property and all that other good, fun stuff, uh, but I think you can tell which is our stuff and which is their stuff. If you can't, well, then send a lawyer to send an email to me, and I'll be glad to chat with them. Other than that, you know what's what, so that's your disclaimer. 